Hey everybody, thank you for uh, joining in for tonight's Midweek Moment. Uh, we're going to be back into the book of James. We're in chapter 1. And as you know, for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the testing of our faith, that God allows our faith to be tested. And last week we talked about uh, the difference between a test and a temptation, that God allows our faith to be tested, but the enemy takes that same test and he wants to use it as a temptation. Now, if you didn't hear last week's uh, teaching, you can get it on Facebook or YouTube. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, Apple Podcast or Spotify, and uh, you can follow along with us if you've missed any of the teachings up to this point. But I wanna jump in tonight because tonight we're gonna break down this whole subject of temptation. Again, when our faith is tested, make sure we keep the test a test and don't allow the test to become a temptation and eventually sin. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to begin there and then we'll get into the uh, book of James. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, here's what Paul said. He said, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, his deception, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Paul talking to the Corinthians is talking about the whole subject of temptation. And he's saying this whole thing begins in the mind. It did with Eve and it does with us. There is a battle going on in our mind to control our thought life. And whoever controls our thought life controls our life. When you talk about the mind and you talk about thoughts, uh, you have to remember what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 16. And I'm not gonna read it, I'm just gonna to refer to it, but I would encourage you to read Matthew 16, uh, verses 13 through probably 23, 24. Because Jesus talks about where thoughts originate. In that passage of scripture, he talks about the thoughts of man. God gave us a brain. He gave us the ability to think for ourselves. And uh, sometimes our thoughts just originate with our thoughts. For example, I got up today and I decided I was gonna wear this shirt. I didn't have to pray about it. I didn't have to ask God to tell me what shirt to wear. I didn't ask God to uh, tell me if I should have iced coffee or hot coffee today. It's just my thoughts. So there's the thoughts of man. There's also, Jesus said, the thoughts of God. God influences our thinking. And we certainly want the mind of Christ. When we're making big decisions in our life, we want to pray and we want God's thoughts. We want the mind of Jesus. But in that passage in Matthew, he also talks about the thoughts of the devil, that the devil can plant thoughts in our mind, that he can influence our thinking. And that's exactly what happened with Eve, that he deceived her in the simplicity of her mind. And so we want to talk about temptation tonight and how it all starts and how it progresses because there is a dangerous progression of temptation. And the idea is to nip it in the bud before it gets out of control. Now let's go to the book of James, chapter 1, verse 14. But each one, that's all of us, each one of us is tempted when he's carried away and enticed of his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished or finished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So James outlining to this church uh, the difference between a test of faith and a temptation from the enemy gives us a four-step progression of how sin happens in our life. First of all, in verse 14, he said it starts with desire. When we talk about desires, we're talking about something that happens in our emotions. And then he talks about our desire becomes lust. Now lust is any kind of unhealthy, uncontrolled desire. That's what lust is. And, and oftentimes we only equate lust to something sexual. But we can lust for power, we can lust for money, we can lust for control. And when we begin to have uncontrolled desires, that's when we find ourselves falling into the state of temptation. Now let's go back to Eve, okay? Back to Eve, back to the beginning, back to where this whole temptation thing all got started in the garden in Genesis chapter three. Notice what it said, the devil said, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, talking about the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God 
knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, that's her desire, delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. This is the first temptation. And the strategy of the devil then has not changed today. He tempts us in the area of our desires. And notice here he said, you can be like God. I want you to think about this for a second. They were already like God. They were created in the image and likeness of God. God gave them everything. He said, be fruitful, multiply, rule over the earth. He gave them everything, and all he did is said, don't eat from one tree. Eat from all the other trees, but avoid this tree. And so the devil comes and he presents this temptation, and he appeals to her mind. He begins to question God in her mind, and then he creates this desire in her, or presents this thing. And desires are normal. Uh, we have to understand that God created us to have certain desires. I have a desire to eat. All of us have a desire to eat. But when we, when we have uncontrolled eating, it's a problem. Uh, all of us desire sleep. Uh, sleep's a good thing. But when we are lazy and we don't want to get out of bed, that's a bad thing. Uh, the desire for sex, God gave human beings the desire for sex. But when sex uh, becomes fornication or adultery, it's out of control. And we have to understand that the enemy comes and he presents this temptation and he appeals to our desires. Now, if we don't get on top of it then, James talks about it becomes deception. Deception deals with my intellect. Temptation never appears to be temptation. The devil doesn't come with a sign to say, okay, I'm getting ready to tempt you and here's the temptation. No, he deceives us. He, he paints a certain picture for us. He uses illusion, if you will. When you, think about, when you think about magic, the greatest magicians are the best illusionists. They use illusion to deceive us. And what happens when they use illusion and deception is they make us believe that something is real. And that's exactly what the devil did to Eve. He begins to deceive her. And in verse 14, James says that we are carried away and enticed. That, that, whole, that whole picture there of carried away and enticed is the picture of, 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 of baiting something. When you go fishing, my son uh, you know, used to bass fish all the time. He has a bass boat and, and he had all different kinds of baits. And the interesting thing about when you fish is you don't just throw a metal hook into the water, but you throw a hook in the water and it's camouflaged with something, okay? It looks like a, a fish, it looks like a frog. It's camouflaged and, and it doesn't look like something dangerous. It looks like something appealing. And that fish is carried away and enticed by the looks of that bait. That's exactly what happened to Eve. And that's what the devil does to us. When we're going through a time of trial and a time of adversity and our faith is being tested, he comes alongside, he uses the same situation to try to appeal to our desires and to deceive us, to make something appear as though it's not, to make us think that somehow God has shortchanged us and we need to do this if we're gonna have what we really want. And then number three in verse 15, James talks about disobedience. So if we don't control the desire and we don't identify the deception, eventually we disobey. And that's where our will comes in. We, we act out on the desire. We follow through with the deception. And that's exactly what Eve did. Eve saw that apple and said, you know what? God is not giving us everything we need. Yes, he gave us this whole garden, but why doesn't he give us this tree? And so she took the fruit and she ate. And then James in verse 15 talks about conception. That sin, or that, that, that deception gives birth to sin. Think about that. Something happens, something takes on life.
And when we sin, something is born, all right? We make up our mind to act on it. And all of a sudden that sin takes on a life of its own, okay? So watch the progression. Desire, deception, disobedience, and then eventually in verse 15 he talks about death. When sin is conceived, something dies. When we sin, when we make the choice to sin and follow through with something that we shouldn't do outside of the parameters of God's will or the parameters of biblical boundaries, something dies in our life. Sin brings forth death. When you think about Adam and Eve, something died. It affected their relationship with God. They had this perfect, harmonious relationship with God. And all of a sudden, that relationship was affected. And not only was their relationship affected, but their sin was passed down to generation to generation. And we're still being impacted by that tragic decision that happened thousands of years ago. So when we sin, we have to realize there are ramifications to our sin. Something, something dies, okay? Uh, when, when we sin, maybe trust dies. All of a sudden, somebody doesn't trust us the way they used to. Uh, something dies like our reputation. We step out and do something and, and it affects our reputation. Uh, it affects a marriage. It affects different aspects of our life. Yes, we can be forgiven. Yes, we can identify that, recognize that, ask God to forgive us and His grace is extended to us. But it doesn't mean that there aren't ramifications to our actions. Because God forgives us doesn't mean that the ramifications go away. If somebody gets in the car and they've been drinking alcohol and they drive down the road and have an accident and run into another car, now the judge may forgive them and the person they ran into may forgive them, but the insurance company may not forgive them. They still have to pay. They still have to come out of pocket to take care of the situation. Their insurance goes up. So understand that James is talking about the testing of our faith. And the important thing is to make sure we keep the test a test and not allow it to become a temptation. Because when it becomes a temptation, all of a sudden there's the desire, there's the deception that he gives to us, uh, there's the disobedience, and eventually something dies in our life. So my friend, we're all gonna be tempted. We can't avoid temptation. Everybody's tempted. It's not, it's not, am I gonna be tempted? Am I gonna follow through with the temptation? Sin is not a plaything. It's not something that we need to joke about, something that we need to just play off and say it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Because when we follow through with sin, something happens in our life. Something dies, something is affected. Someone is affected by those decisions. So the bottom line is this. When your faith is tested, James said rejoice. It's an opportunity to excel, an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to develop your faith and endurance. Just make sure you keep your test a test and don't allow it to become a temptation, all right? I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Hope you have a blessed week, and hopefully I'll see you this Sunday. Take care.